Hold up. Did Marvel predict the invention of flat screen TVs? <laughs> Greetings and felicitations, my minions. I am your evil doctor. In January of 1940, Timely released its third title, Mystic Comics. At that point in time, comic book companies used something called comic book packagers. Basically, they were independent studios that sold comic book stories to book publishers. Timely's first two titles, Marvel Mystery Comics and Daring Mystery Comics, were using material from Lloyd Jaquette's Funnies Incorporated. But for Timely's third title, publisher Martin Goodman used a completely different packager for most of that book's material, the Harry A. Chesler Studio. The Chesler Studio would only be used for the first four issues. And one of the creations that would appear in all four issues was the Dynamic Man. His first appearance was credited to Daniel Peters. Who is Daniel Peters? Nobody knows. It is the only time that byline has ever appeared. And nobody knows if it's a pseudonym or a real name. The story itself opens up in a very stereotypical Hollywood Frankenstein-esque way. With the lonely castle, high atop a mountain, while inside electricity crackles and a mad scientist mad sciencing trying to bring his creation to life. With the usual complaint that the world laughs at him, and at the moment of his greatest triumph, he dies. But fortunately for the story, instead of an anticlimactic ending on page two, the experiment was able to run to its completion, and the dynamic man was born. But as an android creation, not unlike the human torch, but with electrical powers instead of fire. Anyway, he sees his dead creator, and immediately assumes his creator wanted him to go against type and do good in the world. And so he does in his own way. He gives himself a pseudonym, Kurt Cowan, and goes to the FBI Academy in order to become an FBI agent. And since he's an android with superhuman abilities, he completely aces his training and becomes a full-fledged FBI agent. Kurt is given his first assignment by a supervisor, an investigation into a complaint by a farmer that someone is causing drought on his land, despite the supervisor stating that he thinks the letter writer is probably crazy. Hold up! Did Marvel predict weather control conspiracy theories? Okay, I kind of walked into that one. Anyway, the idea of weather control, both superstitious and scientific, had been around for centuries. Through most of the medieval and renaissance periods, there was a belief that witches could control the weather, and that any unexplained weather phenomenon was the result of a witch casting spells or cavorting with demons or some such nonsense. By the 18th century, the understanding that phenomena could be explained through scientific inquiry gained hold, and such superstitions about witchcraft started to wane. However, the interest in weather control remained. There were experiments with gunpowder using cannons and artillery that fired blanks into the air. By the 1930s, a decade of drought known as the Dust Bowl brought devastation to the American Midwest. Such desperation led to communities to turn to people known as rainmakers a mixture of engineers using gunpowder and explosives, and traveling showmen conning desperate people with promises of rain. And this is probably what the supervisor is reacting to, the knowledge that such claims of weather manipulation in the real world have either been met with failure or were just outright scams. But in this story, that is not what is happening here. The farmer isn't claiming he can manipulate the weather, he's saying someone else is. And if this was the real world, that would put it in the realm of the conspiracy theory. Now, the earliest reference to weather control as a conspiracy theory that I could find was in the early 1950s, which isn't to say that such things didn't occur before World War II. More likely that conspiracy theories about weather were not widely reported or given any credence, and there were no alternative avenues for those individuals that believed in such things to express their views. For example, there may well have been many that claimed the American government intentionally created the Dust Bowl, but I have been unable to find any examples of it or the reaction to those views. But there were theories in laboratory experiments in the 1930s with dry ice that showed it's possible to cause water condensation, and thus, in theory, seeding clouds with it should be able to cause it to rain. But large-scale experiments involving cloud seeding wouldn't be done until after World War II with silver iodide being used instead to seed the clouds. One such experiment done by the British was known as Project Cumulus, and would lead to the earliest conspiracy theory that I could find. The Project Cumulus experiment was blamed by some for the Lynmouth flood that occurred on August 16, 1952, that resulted in the deaths of 34 people. However, there is no evidence to support this conspiracy theory, and plenty of evidence that refutes it. Another interesting one from the same time period, though perhaps less relevant, relates to a psychoanalyst named Wilhelm Reich, who was well-respected in his field when he was younger, but started to express very odd theories in his late 30s. 
In his early 50s, he built something called a cloud buster that was supposed to create rain and shoot down UFOs. Most people are probably familiar with his story through the Kate Bush song, Cloud Busting. Perhaps one of the most famous conspiracy theories that deals with weather control is a far more recent one that surrounds HARP, or the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, which was obviously coined by someone who wanted it to spell HARP, though it probably should be called HAFARP. But perhaps that's just me. Anyway, it was a research program originally created by the United States Air Force and Navy for investigating the ionosphere and the potential for better radio communications and surveillance. The U.S. government stopped funding the program in 2014, probably because advances in satellite and digital communication made the project obsolete. However, the University of Alaska took over the project and is now exclusively used on scientific projects designed to explore our upper atmosphere including how it interacts with cosmic events like meteor showers. Conspiracy theorists, though, believe it's capable of a lot of different wacky things, though most notably as that of a weather control weapon, popularized by the late radio host and conspiracy theories promoter Art Bell as early as 1995. Now, the reason I even mention this is that in the story, Kurt goes to investigate the report and discovers that electrical discharges were emanating from a nearby mountain range caused by criminals using a sophisticated dynamo. This is somewhat similar to how conspiracy theorists think HARP works. Come to think of it, with this story, it's not without its scientific basis. Mountains cause rain shadows, where the air that travels up one side of a mountain causes the water vapor to condense in the cooler air and fall as rain or snow, leaving the air on the other side of the mountain drier. Now, applying energy into the air over a mountain should agitate water molecules enough to cause even more precipitation in the mountains, preventing rain from reaching farms, causing pea crops to wither and die, and preventing millions of kids from being forced by the mothers to eat peas. Also, the mountains have no capacity to absorb the water, so it will all rush down into overflowing rivers, causing mass flooding as an extra bonus. Hmm. I'm going to try something. I will be right back. Now to test out this machine. It works! Soon I will be! <coughs> Ouch. Anyway, getting back to the story. Kurt takes matters into his own hands and destroys the dynamo. Which I don't blame him for, because those damn things are dangerous. He follows that up by interrogating the men responsible for the dynamo's operation and discovers that a man called King Bascom was the boss of the whole operation with the intention of buying up farmland. So Kurt heads off to confront the rich banker, but before he gets there, the men operating the dynamo warn Bascom through the use of an advanced television that the dynamic man is coming. And yes, I'm making this entire video based on the artistic choice of a single panel, so sue me. Now, when this story was written, television, and most people would be surprised to learn this, had been around since the 1920s. The first television stations were broadcasting not long after the first radio stations. In fact, the term television was first coined in 1900, and before that, the concept of transmitting pictures instead of sound were already being theorized shortly after the development of the telegraph in the 1800s. The first televisions in the 1920s were really weird devices. They were essentially glorified kinetoscopes. They were mechanical devices that used a spinning wheel, like a stroboscope, that generated the image which could only be seen through a small magnifying lens. This technology was already superseded by electronic televisions with the development of cathode ray tubes by the mid-1930s and demonstrated with great effect at the 1939 New York World's Fair. So the idea that televisions could advance further was a reasonable assumption even though the next advance would be color televisions in the 1950s. What is interesting here is that the shape of this television is perfectly rectangular. Now, televisions at that time had a screen that was somewhat circular to squarish with rounded corners, roughly a 4 by 3 ratio. The rectangular screen we know today wouldn't make an appearance until the 1980s and not become widely used until the end of the 20th century. Now, the 16 by 9 ratio that is used for televisions today was created to bring it in line with the ratio used in motion pictures. Originally, theater films had started using a widescreen format as early as the 1920s. 
but ultimately it proved to be too expensive and was stopped by 1932, with them staying with the standard 4x3 ratio. So by 1940, the widescreen format would have been looked upon as a failed novelty and certainly not a possible future iteration of the format. The widescreen film format wouldn't be revived until the 1950s, ironically as a move to counter the growing popularity of television. Though I should point out the 16x9 widescreen format used today is laid out in a horizontal direction. But the television in the story is in a vertical orientation. Part of the reason why is because he's a supervillain, but mostly because the television in the story was used for communication, which, interestingly enough, was how television was originally envisioned as being, a means of communication replacing the telephone, rather than a means of entertainment and news replacing the radio. Of course, this would not become a reality until late 2006 with the introduction of the smartphone. Nowadays, when someone is talking to somebody on their phone, it makes sense to have it vertically so the person being talked to is properly framed, like a portrait. Eventually, the vertical video format became popular for those making self-produced short videos on such video sites like TikTok and YouTube Shorts. As evil as King Bascom is in this story, even he never envisioned his invention would be used for this. Now this might be the first case in this series where an act of imagination would later become reality rather than borrowing from another source. Did the artist intend it this way? Who knows? In one aspect, the artist looked like he drew a mirror, attached some wires, and called it a day. It's not that different than prop makers for science fiction movies using everyday items to create futuristic-looking devices. On the other hand, the artist could have been extrapolating technological trends and conceived of an efficient design for communication purposes while at the same time trying to look futuristic. There's also some evidence to support this point of view. This panel here, drawn by Jack Kirby, is from Amazing Adventures number 3 from 1961 showing a vertical video alignment for communication. So clearly without any cultural prompts, the natural instinct was to draw such devices in a portrait mode. However, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter the intention. The end result was that the artist drew a device that ultimately one day became reality. So anyway, at some future point, I may come back and revisit this story and tell you how it ended. But for now, I will end the video here. So until next time, stay evil. Um, evil. Though it probably should be called a farp. <laughs> what? what? Sound like I burps there.